Let us pray. Gracious God, we're thankful for how you feed our souls and how you calm the storms in our lives. Because of that, help us have no fear. For your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Within the stories of hope and healing, fear will always be found. Uh, my kids were ages 16, 14, and 12. Their mother and I had just returned from a trip to Russia. And we brought back with us several bottles of vodka. They were gifts, and at the same time, a trademark of, of Mother Russia. How many of you ever thought you'd see a picture of vodka bottles in worship on Sunday? How many of you ever thought you'd see that? And so we stashed them in the kitchen pantry. We thought nothing of it several months later when we took a week off and visited some friends. And halfway to the trip, through the trip, uh, their mother turned to me and with a worried look asked, do you think we have to worry about the kids finding the vodka and having a party? I said, they don't even know where these bottles are in the pantry. I'm not worried at all. And upon the return from the trip, we checked the pantry. They were still there. Nothing appeared touched. Our worries, unfounded. And several months later, <clears throat> she and I were hosting some friends for an evening gathering. And as part of the evening, we mentioned our trip to Russia and the vodka we brought back. And they said, hey, we'd like to try. What does, what does this taste like from Russia? I went to the pantry, retrieved a bottle of Russia's finest, poured several drinks, and as people tasted it, they were, is this vodka from Russia, Ed? I said, yeah, it, it should taste pretty good. I, it doesn't taste like vodka, Ed. What, what is this stuff? Here, let me try it, I responded. And by golly, it wasn't vodka. My kids pulled a fast one. They did have a party. They did serve the vodka, and they refilled the bottles with water. It was a vodka into water miracle that happened. <laughs> I, I tried. They tried to assuage our fears and provide hope of never being caught by putting water in a vodka bottle. Now, of course, none of us would ever think of doing that in our teenage years. Busted. It's a good way to describe the kids that got busted. And busted is a good way to describe a couple of characters in this story of feeding the 5,000 and walking and taking the boat across the sea. Philip is busted. When Jesus saw the large crowd coming his way, he asked Philip, where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? And in good, practical, church fashion, Philip replied, we can't afford it. Fear conditioned Philip's outlook. Not a trace of hope to be found. Busted. Andrew is the next one up. Well, we have a young boy here with five barley loaves and two small fish. In fact, they're really the Greek says they were scrawny looking fish. They should have been thrown back after they were caught. That's how small they were. And Andrew asked, but what are these among so many people? Fear conditioned Andrew's finding of something. A theology of scarcity. What we have is not enough. It will never be enough. This passage, it has it all. It has scarcity, storms, and a savior. The responses by Philip and Andrew are, are, don't take this the wrong way, but they're so churchy. They really are. We can't afford it. How will we pay for it? What we have isn't enough. Pastor, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. I've served every one of those churches in my career. 
We might as well fill the empty vodka bottles up with water, put them back on the shelf, and hope we don't get caught. The beginning of this story references the Passover. It's, it's more than a tip to the reader of the spiritual calendar. John is, is telling us that Jesus is going to give us a, a new twist to the understanding of Passover. The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, celebrates God's deliverance of Israel from captivity in Egypt to the Promised Land. Even the tale of Moses leading the Hebrew people to freedom is filled with fear and hope. It, it's so much of life. It's, it's, it's fear and it's hope when we're looking for healing. The feeding of the 5,000 is a, another poor footer, if you will, in the story of freedom and liberation of God's people from theological captivity. I, I sometimes think our, our faith, our understanding of faith, becomes like a jailhouse for us. We feel locked in, and we don't feel free. Jesus came to turn the tables of life upside down and give us a new understanding of what believing in God is all about. We need to see the feeding of the 5,000 through the lens of captivity, of being trapped. The people share a new life together. You know, when we share the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of each month, besides the, the trial and tribulation of opening that cellophane and pulling out that piece of wafer, and then, you know, then we're brilliant if we can actually get the, the cup to pour into our mouth. I mean, that's the, that's the big celebration we have. When we share the Lord's Supper a Christian variation of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's more than just food for the body. The Lord's Supper is more than a social service event of feeding people. Twenty-some years ago, the Episcopalian Church had a thing called the Church Ad Project. They were embarking on a marketing campaign to invite people to worship, and I thought the ads they came up with were extremely brilliant. It was a witty and engaging campaign that would pick the interest of people who may think about or not think about going to church. One such ad featured the picture of a lottery ticket. And it said, if you're looking for happiness here, you're only scratching the surface. Another one, which I kind of like, featured the catchphrase, join us for Easter dinner, and had a picture of a Eucharist with bread in the cup. I thought they were clever. You know, we sometimes try to reduce a miracle to an engineering event, a rationale. And these stories are not meant to be boiled down to an engineering formula. It's not possible. This is a theological event, a statement of hope and healing, Freedom and community, a description of the Messiah in our midst who feeds our hungry souls. Jesus is not one to become a king to make our bellies full, to usher in a social welfare state. No, Jesus the Messiah feeds our hungry souls. He never turns away someone looking for their soul to be fed. And Jesus is telling us to have no fear for the spiritually hungry in our midst. Have no fear when crowds gather. No fear when you need everything and you have nothing. Interestingly enough, when you look at the story, not one single person who showed up, not one, asked to be fed. Not one. No one said, hey, can I have a menu? Where's the table? No one's asked that. It's about the spiritual feeding. In November of 2019, when I worked for General Langell at the Pentagon, he took me along on Thanksgiving to Djibouti, where we fed soldiers going through the line at the DFAC, the dining facility. It's not that we were feeding hungry people. We were showing that as, even as senior leaders, we are servant leaders to care for the people under our command, if you will. It's feeding the soul, feeding the spirit, feeding the mind. Not so much the food that's there, but that sense of servant leadership. A great example of taking care of people. Jesus sees the large crowds coming towards him, and he is proactive in taking care of them. 
You know, they didn't hand out apps to accumulate points for discounted meals. They weren't at the wall where you pull your card out and get scanned so you get a free cup of coffee $50 later. No, there are no coupons with 10% off, no two-for-ones. It's sit down, and we're going to take care of you. When they're asked to sit down, the Greeks suggest that they were to, to like, recline, not just, you know, sit down on a blanket like a, you're at the beach, but this sense of a relaxed period of time where you're reclining like Jesus reclined at the Last Supper. It's the same word that's used. And here's the scene. A young kid with loaves and two scrawny fish, 5,000 people reclining in the grass, Jesus taking the loaves and giving thanks. That's the image that we have. It's like a cook-in with the entire St. Andrews Boulevard crowd showing up, Bonnie, and we don't know what to do. And the people are nourished beyond belief. It's not just the food for the body. It's the food for the soul. To put it another way, there are songs, poems, passages, quotes, and books that inspire our souls. They feed our spirit. We read them, and it makes us feel at peace, or it stirs our spirit. It makes us think about things in a new way. Think about the reasons you come to church are not for the coffee hour. Well, maybe it is, and I don't know that. But we come to worship to engage the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of life. We, to be assured, once again, of God's love in our lives when we feel unloved. We come here to sing some rocking songs written 300 years ago. Enjoy fellowship with friends, to seek peace, have our spirits nourished, to taste and eat the bread of life, to comfort the afflicted, and maybe to afflict the comforted, I don't know. There are many reasons the prayers we seek and receive are important to us. To have a person's name mentioned in a prayer it feeds the soul, it feeds the spirit to know that someone is praying for me or for you in a difficult time. It brings us comfort. It's that one moment in the week when we shed our political identities and wrap ourselves in the cloak and coat of Christianity and see each other as God's children. We drop nationalities, we drop prejudices for this one moment and live, celebrate, pray, and gather as God's people. We want to eat that bread of life. We're desperate to have our spirits nourished and fed. The crowds follow Jesus for healing and hope. We follow for the same reasons and perhaps many, many more. And let's be honest, so many times it's just like, Filling the vodka bottle with water and putting it back on the shelf doesn't change his taste. After feeding the 5,000 and having an abundance of food left over, Jesus, he just disappears. People saw him and wanted to make him king because he took care of their physical needs. And that's not his purpose, his mission as he escapes to the mountain. It's important to be clear about mission and purpose as individuals and as a church. You know, as a pastor, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a psychologist. I'm a pastor. Jesus taking care of the spiritual needs of the people, seeking hope and healing. That is his mission. Years ago, there was a book written on pastoral care, and it was very specific, very, very spot on, saying when people come to see a pastor or come to worship in a church, they're not looking for a psychologist. They're not looking for a mental health worker. They're not looking for a social worker. They want someone who will hold their hand close their eyes, and pray for them because their life is not going well that day. And the themes of faith we have are many. The theme in this story is have no fear. Do not be afraid of challenges. Do not be afraid of scarcity, for Jesus is the Lord of abundance. Do not be afraid of the dark. Do not be afraid of the storm. Do not be afraid... Or as Jesus says in John 14, do not, let your hearts be, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The people see in Jesus the fulfillment of Deuteronomy and Elijah and Elijah. They see this as the, the new exodus, as you will, this new Passover that takes place. And let's look at it in just one more other way. There is fear in the eyes of Philip. Fear in the words of Andrew, and fear gripping the hearts of the disciples as they board the boat without Jesus and encounter a storm. You guys ever been on that boat? We were on that last week. 
the princess down there. Listen, I've only been here three months. I'm on the boat. You guys have been here longer than I have. One person in the sermon musings group quipped to me, person emailed this to me and said, why would the disciples leave the shore on their boat without their leader? And why would Jesus be late for the ride? I can only think of Peter looking at his watch and mumbling to himself, yeah, he can feed 5,000 people, he can raise the dead, but he can't show up on time for a boat ride? Come on, help me out here. There is fear and then there's powerlessness. Two emotions that when combined together make our knees buckle, our spirits depressed, our outlook diminished. Powerlessness. On a minor note, you know, powerlessness, I mean, this is so trivial. It's like having a television provider with over 1,500 channels and there's nothing on TV. Powerlessness. And it's more than that. Large, hungry crowds having no provisions, turbulent weather, unpredictable economies, petty politics, wars, famine, name it, and we are powerless. We look at the stuff and there's nothing we can do. But we can pray. We have so many ways to escape this feeling of being powerless. We go from the news about senseless shootings to changing the channel and watching some 20-year-old comedy that we grew up on. The story is about fear. It's about powerlessness. It's about Jesus conquering fears, establishing trust, and Jesus walking with us through the storms of life. Within the stories of hope and healing, fear will always be found. Jesus couldn't shape the crowds. It's as if they had first century iPhones tracking him wherever he went. The GPS followed him. They saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. The crowds probably talked about Jesus like we talk about doctors. I couldn't figure out what was wrong, and then I changed doctors, changed God. Boom, I got it fixed. There's a lot of worry and fear in today's story. Let me just close with this. We sometimes let the miraculous become, the miraculous obscure the meaning. It's astounding to feed 5,000 people, but it's feeding the souls. It's like a good friend of mine, this goes back 30 years ago, went through a painful divorce, horrible divorce. Hadn't been to church for a long, so he goes to church to have his spirit nourished. Walks in the back door, gets a seat somewhere in the middle of the sanctuary, and instead of being comforted by God's love, the only thing talked about that day was making sure we hit the mark to raise enough money to replace the air conditioning system. What's amazing about this story is hope and healing. Hope and healing are so powerful. Hundreds of people follow him. They hunger for the bread of life. And yet Jesus walked on water without sinking. There is something else truly amazing about this story. Jesus is present among ordinary, insecure, and timid persons. And he calms their fears and anxieties. He gives them enough strength to walk in the end through their own Golgothas, their own crucifixion, their own sacrifices. As one commentator wrote, what is genuinely miraculous is not that a dead body should come to life again, but that through the journey with the crucified one, the Christ, the disciple community was enabled to find hope on the far side of despair, faith that could live with doubt and the courage to live beyond the sting of death. Within stories of hope and healing, fear will always be found. Our faith is not something that can be replaced like water in a vodka bottle. Faith removes fears. Faith projects hope and healing, and it is Jesus who feeds our souls and walks with us across the troubled waters of life that will always be there, but it's how we approach it. Have no fear. Amen.